So we are going to pick up where we left off, which is with the election day registration process. So for the part two of this video series, we'll work through election day registration. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about who can be in the polling place. And then if we have any time remaining, we'll actually do a very quick introduction to the equipment that you'll be working with on election day. But otherwise, that'll all be in part two, um, as I mentioned. So we don't necessarily have to get through all of that today. So election day registration. Minnesota has a extensive uh, list of opportunities for voters to register on election day. And so the whole point to this material today is to orientate you to what is an option. And then you're going to use other resources to help you get the rest of the way. And we'll talk about some of those resources as we move through. Uh, but I will point out that page 22 of your election judge guide is going to be the start of all of the detail that you might need. So the way that this usually shakes out is if the voter's not registered and we're sure they're not registered in the right location, then we're going to have a conversation with them to figure out how they can best register. Uh, is it a driver's license? Is it a utility bill? And we'll talk through those in just a bit. Um, and if you can't find a way that seems to be working, going to your guide, going to your head judge, uh, going to your county elections employee uh, are all ways to help you get to that point. So. We want to make sure that we're registering voters as necessary and kind of following the rules that exist for that to occur. And those rules that are, that are, uh, exist um, are going to be uh, what we explain on the next several slides. So if you have a voter who's not registered the right end in the right location, we're going to go through a process that requires three checks and then they complete an application. We do the three checks first because we want to make sure that that voter is going to be able to complete the process before you start the process. There's nothing more frustrating for you as an election judge or for that voter if they get all the way to needing to prove their residency and they don't have a copy of the utility bill. So we go through the checks first and then we go into the process. Okay, so check number one, the voter must be eligible to vote in the state of Minnesota. Eligibility to vote in the state of Minnesota requires several components. First off, they must be a U.S. citizen. Second, they must be 18 years of age or older on that election day. Third, they must be a resident of the state of Minnesota for at least 20 days. Okay, so we'll stop at those three. Uh, 18 years of age on election day is for that election. The poll pad will not allow you to register somebody who's under 18, so we take care of that one for you. You can and will need to provide some assistance on the residency piece if that's ever in question. It's residency in the state. So that means that the new voter could have moved from Roseau County the day before, as long as they've lived in Minnesota for 20 days. All right. A couple of these other provisions on this slide are, are more unusual, but we want to talk about at least the felony one to more extent. Uh, so felony status uh, prohibits somebody from voting in Minnesota. The felony status means that they're still under sentence or serving part of a probation for a felony conviction. Voters are expected and obligated to know that themselves, uh, but oftentimes they won't. So you've got a couple of keys that are going to help you with that. First off, the poll pad will indicate whoever is listed as challenged for felony reasons in the state of Minnesota. So if that pops up on your screen, that's a good indication that we've got an issue that we need to work through, but ultimately it's up to the voter to work through that with you. Uh, the voter should be encouraged to talk to their probation officer, or if there's any doubts at all, you can call us at the elections office on election day, and we have a relay through the Department of Corrections to verify status. So uh, if a voter has any concern about felony status, let's make sure we clear that up before they register. Uh, voting as a felon, is another felony and so we just don't want to put voters into that situation okay last two pieces on this slide are a little uh are much rarer in their instances in the polling place but we want you to be aware of that uh, minnesota law allows somebody who's under guardianship to vote provided that that right hasn't been rescinded by a court of law uh, and uh, conversely if somebody has been deemed legally incompetent by a court of law they are not eligible to vote Again, judges aren't uh, determining that. Um, judges are only making people aware of that. So if somebody would say, you know what, I've lost my right to vote because I'm under, uh, I've been deemed legally incompetent, we would want to stop the voting process at that point in time, right? But you're not asking people these questions. So let's talk about some of the other provisions that would uh, be required for somebody to register to vote. First, they've proved their eligibility. That's check one. 
Check two now is going to have them prove their residency. So to make this simpler for us, we say, are you eligible? Then we prove your place and then we prove your face. So to prove that place component, uh, we need to know where that voter currently resides or where they consider their uh, current resident. We make sure the voters in the right location uh, for the address that they're claiming as their residency, and then we have to verify that out. We almost always verify that out with a current driver's license. So usually what happens is if somebody isn't pre-registered and you say, okay, we're going to register you on election day, one of the first questions you're going to ask is, do you have a current driver's license with your current name and address? We add that that's never required to vote in Minnesota. You're not required to produce that, but we let folks know that that's a very easy way to register to vote in Minnesota. If you get a driver's license that's current on name, current on address, you've met all of your checks and you get to move right along to the application process. If they don't have a driver's license that's current, then we can look at other ways to prove place. We can prove it with a tribal ID, we can prove it with a utility bill, a lease statement, a credit card statement, something to that effect. And that, that document can be electronic or it can be uh, in paper form. Uh, and the list that's provided on this slide is provided in your judge guide. It's provided at the poll pad tables. It's provided in all of our resources. There's even handouts to give voters. Because while this list is pretty exhaustive, it has to be on this list. The poll pad lists all of these items and that's what we're gonna use to register voters. Mike? Yes, sir. So can you clarify banking credit card since we had that issue? You yep. know? So if they show a credit card is okay, but they can't show the bank statement or these are. Yep, uh, so a credit card statement. So the monthly statement from a credit card company is okay. A bank statement or a checking statement or whatever that might look like a, a savings account statement is okay, provided it's actually that document from the bank. Some things that are not okay, um, we get this question quite regularly, is like a medical a, a assistance or insurance statement from Blue Earth County Human Services. That's not on the list, so that's not acceptable. Uh, Blue Earth County property tax statement isn't on the list, so it's not acceptable, uh, those sorts of things. So if it's on this list, it can be digital or paper and be acceptable. Is auto insurance on the list? Not on the list, sir, no. No, so that's not acceptable. They'd have to go to a different route or we've got an opportunity for them to vouch, which we'll talk about in just a slide or two. Okay. Yes, ma'am. How do the homeless vote? Uh, how do uh, homeless folks vote? Uh, they've got a couple of opportunities available to them. Some do actually have identification cards. Um, and so if that happens to be in the right precinct and whatnot, they're good, just like any other voter. Um, but almost all of our homeless folks are gonna be voting through the voucher process that we'll talk about where a uh, employee of a homeless shelter or facility is going to vouch for them on election day in order to complete the voting process. One last statement before I move off of this place idea is that um, while we want to be super uh, accommodating to voters, if the voter is having trouble pulling up that document on their phone or something like that, we want to move them out of line and make sure that they get all their ducks in a row before they come back in line. Um, it's stressful for them to try to retrieve a password and get an account reset and all of that. So just let them move along and let them know that they're in line, they're gonna be able to vote, so they get to do it uh, when, when they get that all pulled up. The last thing I'll also note about those digital images, because they're awesome and they've helped a lot of people be able to vote, we have to make sure that they're right. So um, somebody can't pull up an email that might say, the city of Mankato has billed you $43 for your water for this month they actually have to go into the account and pull up the likeness of the bill so that you can see that it is actually a bill that has that address on it. Okay. It has to be within 30 days, right? Absolutely, yep, that's a very good point. All of these proofs of places have to be within 30 days current, and the lease actually has to be valid on election day, since that's where they're saying they live. Yeah, very good point, thank you. Uh, so we've checked one, uh, made sure they're eligible to vote. Check two, proved where they live and it's in the right precinct. Check three, we're going to prove who they are or prove their face. And we need to do that uh, through a match. So once we've proven where they live and we see that their name is on that documentation, that same name has to be on the documentation that they're using to prove their identity or their face. This can be a driver's license. It could be an expired driver's license. It could be a printed ID card if they're renewing their uh, ID at the current time. Uh, all of those options work in Minnesota to prove that. 
as does a passport, a student ID, a college ID, uh, various lists there. Again, that list is pretty exhaustive, but it must be on the list that's in your materials in order to be a valid proof of, of identity of face. So we've proven face, uh, we've proven place, we've proven eligibility. Now we know that person is eligible to vote in the state of Minnesota, and so we're gonna work through the poll pad prompt to get that person registered. One of the nice features of the poll pad is it won't allow you to register a voter who shouldn't be registered if you follow the prompts. It lists all the options to select and it allows you to work through that uh, pretty effectively. Um, so take your time with that and make sure that you're following all the screens. Uh, related to that, we wanna make sure uh, that when you are actually processing that voter through the process, we're gonna have two receipts print out. The first receipt is gonna be a receipt that is the application for the voter. That's their, their statement that they're registering as a new voter. And then their oath as a new voter prints out. So we collect two signatures from those folks once they've registered on election day. Right. So what I've just described there uh, probably sounds super intensive um, and it is, there's a lot to it. But if you follow those steps and take your time, it should be pretty good. And I always like to kind of pull the group of our returning judges once you get comfortable with the registration, we're hearing it's usually about a two minute process for most of them. You move through them pretty quickly. So it seems like there's a lot to it, but you get very comfortable with the pull pad pretty quickly, especially if you uh, are fortunate enough to be assigned a precinct where you might have 50% new voter registrations. Yes, sir. How do you represent the oath or their signature? How do you? How much detail? you put in rather yeah. than just saying sign it. Yep, so it's up to the voter to sign the oath, whether or not that requires them to read it word for word or uh, or skim it, that's that's up to the voter to decide. So it's provided on the receipts and it's also provided in a larger print yeah. format for voters to review. Yes? Yeah, the larger print form really helps. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they say I can't read that. Yeah, exactly. So the, the the small print is identical to the larger print. We've just tried to make it more accessible to voters. Okay. So I mentioned all of those processes to register to vote, proving place, proving face. If that's not possible, if we're still having issues getting that voter registered, but they're at the right location and otherwise eligible, we have the ability to have somebody else vouch for that voter. So this is kind of our catch all. We don't want this one to be your default registration process, but it is in state law for folks uh, on election day to use. So what happens in a vouching situation is that a voter who is registered or who is able to be registered in that precinct is able to vouch for another voter, provided they have personal knowledge that that other voter lives in the precinct. So it's on the voucher to be able to make that statement. And in fact, they'll complete an oath of their own through the registration process saying that they personally know somebody uh, lives in that precinct and they're choosing to vouch for them. Scenarios where you'll see this quite commonly in uh, Blue Earth County, uh, uh, a spousal unit where they're new to the area. So not all the bills have maybe been turned over or the licenses haven't been updated. You might have one individual of the, the couple being able to prove their mm -hmm. registration requirements and then they'll vouch for their spouse, their husband, their wife. Uh, and that's completely fine and normal. The other scenario where you'll see a fair amount of vouching is in our, our off-campus college housing, where you might have five individuals living in the same rental unit. One of them always has their uh, eyes dotted and their T's crossed and brings in everything they need. And then their friends have come along for the ride to vote. And that's completely fine as long as that vouching situation is carried out in those instances, okay? Vouchers in Minnesota can vouch for up to eight voters. Uh, the poll pads will keep track of that as you're recording who is doing the vouching. Um, so that will help manage that limitation. Uh, and then we also wanna point out that Minnesota does not allow for what's called chain vouching. So if I uh, show up on election day and I can't register, so I need to be vouched for, I can't turn around and vouch for somebody else. If I show up on election day and I register the normal way, then I can vouch for somebody else. If I show up on election day and I'm already pre-registered, I can vouch for somebody else, right? We just can't have vouchers turning around and vouching for other folks. Okay. 
Uh, as you approach people who are going to go down that vouching process, it's really important to take a breath and say, OK, what's going on here to make sure that the voucher is ready and available, that we know who the voucher is. Check them in first if they're voting so that you can be prepared uh, with some of the information that they're going to need. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you stress, please, because this is the only time that the full pad is shown to anybody in line. Yep, that's a very good point. Thanks for making that. Uh, so the full pad is going to uh, contain private voter data, and so voters do not access the polling pad unless they're the voucher who needs to sign their voucher poll. Um, otherwise, that's private information. That's going to come up when we talk about challengers in the polling place as well. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next couple of slides are going to walk through some scenarios that are very uh, Unusual, they're unique scenarios for registering to vote on election day. Think of these slides as more of a resource. I'm not going to go through them because there's a good chance you're not going to see these uh, appear in your polling places. The way that you approach this is hey, can we use a current driver's license? Because that's going to get most of them. Nope, great. We're going to find a way to register you proving your identity in your place. Uh, if we can't get you there, does vouching work? If vouching doesn't work, now let's open up the manual and figure out how we're going to get you registered. Is it through a residential facility? Is it through um, a late registration notice that you might have received and is at home? Might it be through the student housing list that will be available for the November election? And the student housing list is just what it sounds like. Uh, our campuses in town, Bethany and MSU, provide us with a listing of students who uh, reside on campus or reside near campus. It lists their name and their address, and that can be used as proof of place as long as you can match that to a proof of face, right? Driver's license, student ID, something like that. Uh, so oftentimes you'll work your way through your list and, and find that to be the solution for our voters who are of college age. Yes. The biggest problem we've had with that student list is Students put their address when they're freshmen, and then they move, 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 so that it's not correct. Yeah, and we've worked with the campuses on that. That's through the registrar's office, and so they're really trying to get students to keep that information up to date. But that information is only as good as the data we have. So if that's not the right address, then that student needs to find a different way to register. Good point. Okay. Uh, just in case you wanted to see all of the steps laid out in a more chronological order, uh, we just provide that slide for you uh, here so you can kind of see uh, how to work through that. Again, just another resource. Might be something you review prior to election day, but it'll also match some of the tips and tricks we'll give you uh, if you are at that station and, and have that. That task assigned to you. If you want to learn even more about election day registration, uh, we give you a, a, a series of resources here. Your head judges will have some experience. Uh, the county election staffer, if you're in Mankato, will be able to help you through that. Otherwise, we're always a phone call away. Um, and because we have poll pads as well, we can walk you through screen by screen on some of those more unusual circumstances. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, as we move forward from there now, we're going to start talking about a completely different subject. And this is a subject that we're going to spend maybe five minutes or so on just to make sure that you're very familiar um, with uh, what's going on in the polling place, who's allowed to be there and whatnot. <clears throat> and um, this is another area of a focus that we want to make sure that we've got all of our judges at least having a general understanding of uh, in case we have issues that might present themselves on election day. We really hope not, uh, but it seems like each election it's uh, become a little bit more uh, likely to occur. And so we want you all to feel comfortable and prepared. So. With that prelude, let's talk about who can be in the polling place before we talk about who can't be in the polling place. So election judges are allowed in the polling place. Uh, that is an election judge who has been trained, certified, and appointed. So what that means is if you're working the afternoon shift, unfortunately, you can't come at 10 in the morning and just hang out in the polling place. Uh, that's why we want to make sure we have your shifts right and you're ready for that. Of course, you can come a little bit early to get settled in. We just can't have you loitering in the polling place. It also would include any judges who um, think that they're trained because they applied. If they're not on that roster to work in that polling place and your head judge hasn't received a call from us to add people, they're not eligible to be in that polling place. All right. Um, also want to make sure that you're aware that in certain instances, we will be sending county election staff that are not assigned to your polling place to help out with supply or technology issues. But again, they will be badged and they will introduce themselves to the head judge and then they'll explain their, their role uh, while they're there. Okay. Other folks that can be in the polling place would obviously be the voter. 
It also includes anybody who is eligible, or excuse me, who is participating in the voting process. And that has to be direct engagement. So what we mean by that is a voucher can be in the polling place because they're participating in the voting process. Even if they voted, maybe maybe mom voted at seven in the morning because she was number one in line and her kid finally woke up at noon and needs a voucher, she can come back and vouch, but then she needs to leave the polling place, right? Um, we talked about his sisters. The sisters are allowed in the polling place with the voter. If the voter asks them to be there, they can't hang out in the room uh, being willing to provide assistance, they have to come in only with that voter. And then Minnesota law allows children to observe the voting process with their parents, or with the voter, I should say, not necessarily the parents. Other folks that fall in the authorized category would be police officers. Our head judges and our county staff are authorized to call law enforcement if that would be necessary. Uh, law enforcement understand our polling places, their locations, and their responsibilities in the polling place. We communicate with them in advance. Um, so we don't deploy anybody, um, but you get to make that call if that would be necessary. Uh, we also um, have to allow uh, folks that are going to observe the election but that observation is only if it was pre-appointed by the Secretary of State's office or by me as the county auditor. So when I use the word observer there, I'm not talking about a poll watcher or a poll observer. This is a very formal process that you will know about before that person arrives, okay? Making that clear. Uh, the media is allowed in there. They'll provide credentials to the head judge. Exit pollers are allowed to be outside of the polling place. Uh, they will also present credentials and they are also pre authorized by our office. And then we're going to talk about challengers on the next slide. All right. Uh, so these are the folks that can be in there. By Minnesota law, everybody else is excluded. So we don't have poll watchers, we don't have poll observers. We don't have any other uh, folks by any other names that would be allowed in the polling place. Um, that would be something that would need immediate attention. Okay, so escalate that to your head judge and beyond if necessary. Okay. Let's talk about challengers a little bit. So the challenger in Minnesota is a very, very, very specific role and not many people understand that. Um, when you hear about challengers and poll watching on maybe national news or whatnot, uh, that is a much broader category than is allowed in Minnesota. In Minnesota, in order to become a challenger, you have to be appointed by a major political party or by a candidate on the ballot. And that appointment is going to be formalized in writing. And that's going to be presented to your head judge when they arrive. They don't have to pre-announce or pre-register, um, but they have to uh, be certified when they arrive. That certification process will be explained to the head judges. It requires them to prove their eligibility to be uh, in the polling place. Um, but once they've been authorized to be in there as a challenger, they now have a very limited role. And their limited role is only to challenge a voter if they have personal knowledge of that voter's ineligibility to vote. So that's a very high bar, personal knowledge of ineligibility to vote. All outside of that capacity, they're not able to converse with voters. They're not allowed to make lists or record the voting process. That means they can't have phones out. They can't have laptops out. It means that they, it, it, and they also are not allowed to handle or interfere with the voting process at all. So that means that they're not allowed to see the private data on a poll pad. Uh, it doesn't allow them to ask a voter's name. It doesn't allow them to do anything other than state a challenge based on personal knowledge of ineligibility to vote. Yes, ma'am. Can they have um, like a t-shirt? For a certain candidate? Uh, campaigning is not allowed in the polling place. No. Good question. Um, so if we do have a challenger present, and if that challenger has personal knowledge of somebody's ineligibility to vote, remember super high bars there, they go through the challenge process. The challenge process is going to require them to take an oath and document that challenge, and their communication is always going to be with the election judge. Usually it's going to be the head judge, but it could be a different delegated judge. That challenger states their challenge and their basis for it, their personal knowledge. The judge turns around and communicates that challenge to the voter. The voter then is going to work through an oath of his or her own, either saying I disagree with that challenge or I do agree with that challenge. If the voter says that they disagree with the challenge and that they're eligible to vote, the judge allows them to vote as if it was a normal process, right? Okay, if the voter says, no, I'm not eligible to vote, thank you challenger for telling me so. Um, 
then that person is not eligible to vote in that election. They can't come back. And so it's very important as an election judge then that you would mark that challenge failed on the poll pads so that, that voter's eligibility is gone for that election. Okay. So I go through all of this detail and it's really important for you to know that detail. However, you're almost certainly not gonna go through a challenge process because of how high that bar is. You might have a challenger present, but you're, they're not likely gonna be able to challenge a voter because they have to have that personal knowledge. It would really need to be somebody who lives in that neighborhood who happens to know if somebody has moved out of that neighborhood to make that challenge be uh, able to move forward. Okay. Questions on that process at all? All right, um, one other thing that I will note about challengers as we move to the next slide is that challengers do have to be residents of Minnesota, um, but what we hear and see of is that challengers are coming out of the cities. So if you do happen to have a challenger who comes out of the cities, they will almost certainly not be able to challenge voters because that personal knowledge threshold is, is going to be very hard to reach. So just something to be aware of. Yes. So, so if they're assigned as a challenger, they have the documentation, they just stay there all day. Yep. So if they don't know anybody potentially. Potentially, yep. They get to stay there and not interfere and not record. Um, and so I say potentially they stay there all day because uh, parties can rotate in challengers. They just can't have more than one. So oftentimes they might switch out a noon time. Your challenger can leave the polling place if they need to make a phone call or use the restroom or whatever, they come back in. It's just one per party. All right, awesome. Some other things just to keep in mind about polling place activities. Um, uh, it is against the law in Minnesota to have anybody observe the voting process. They need to be participating in the voting process or be a challenger, um, be off of that list. Uh, it is against the law to tear down damage or deface equipment. Uh, it's against the law to act in a disorderly fashion after they've been warned. The, the individual has the right to be warned that their actions are not allowable. Uh, we would want to document that warning, and then if we would need to escalate that, we would escalate that as well. Um, we talked about campaigning already, and then uh, maybe it's not interestingly to you, interesting to you, but it's an interesting law out there that says that voters who are obviously intoxicated are not allowed to vote. So that is probably the only instance where an election judge would be turning away an otherwise eligible voter is if there's obvious intoxication. That would be a phone call to our office. We can help you uh, document that and work through that scenario. Yeah, we had an individual, first of all, came in with all the campaign stuff. I asked her to move it. She said, yeah, I know you have me do that so she can lie. Then she started the conversation, you know, I don't think you're, you didn't make me show a photo ID you on know, this long conversation. At what point do you ask them to leave? Yeah. So what you want to do in that instance is it's all based on context, right? So if, if they're asking legitimate questions and you can provide information to help them understand the process better, we want to do that. That can help us out immensely throughout the entire election process. Um, but we want to make sure that they're doing it from that position and not trying to disrupt the voting process for 10 or 15 people who are now backing up in line. So that's where if it is a simple question, we can answer it great, but otherwise we can explain to them that uh, voters are, are needing to need to be actively engaged in the voting process and we help you move along through the process, right? And, and then try to proceed that way. If it gets to a point where they start being disruptive or otherwise, then we can start explaining that the law prohibits those activities. So, but hopefully that quick answer of their question allows them to move along. But I know exactly what you're talking about. There's some folks who just try to make that challenge. <laughs> Other questions about that? I hope we don't have a lot of issues there, um, but that is just one area of focus that we want you to be comfortable with so that you at least know how to kind of handle that if it would present itself. Okay. All right, with that, we're gonna switch to um, the topic of closing the polls. So this again occurs, occurs at 8 p.m. or after 8 p.m. if you have voters in line. Remember the law tells us that anybody in line at 8 p.m. is eligible to vote. It, and entitled to vote provided that they can prove that eligibility. That means they can't go home and get uh, their lease statement and come back. They have to have that all ready to roll uh, at eight o'clock or sooner. Okay. End of night responsibilities are pretty lengthy and so you'll, uh, your head judges will have a pretty detailed list of tasks to complete and they'll assign judges to complete some of those tasks. So make sure you're finding an area that you can be helpful as directed. Uh, and most importantly, we want to make sure you do not leave until directed to leave by your head judge. Uh, there are a lot of certifications and audits and things that our election judges sign off on before they leave at the end of the night. And so we want to make sure that everybody who's participated in that process acknowledges that it's been completed. 
Okay. Um, a couple of other things that we will just mention about that slide is that once the polls are officially closed, meaning we've hit that eight o'clock hour and the voters are done, it becomes open to the public. So at that point, whoever wishes to come in can come in and observe your work closing the polls. They can't interfere or touch any of the equipment, but they are entitled to actually uh, be in the polling place if they would so choose. Do you have any questions about the uh, end of night, end of election day? All right, very good. So with the last five minutes that we have here, we want to just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the equipment. As I mentioned, the equipment is actually going to be talked about in detail in uh, the next class, which will be our elections equipment setup class. And then you'll actually be able to apply that knowledge in the workshop if you've signed up for that, where you'll be able to sit down at a poll pad. But I want to just make everybody familiar with what we're using in the polling places. And what we're using in the polling places are the DS200 tabulator. Uh, that is what counts the votes. Make sure that folks aren't filling in too many ovals or crossing over amongst the party columns. Uh, all of our polling places in Blue Earth County use the same type of equipment. That equipment is tested repeatedly prior to the election, and then it is audited after the election with a hand count of certain ballots. From all ballots from certain precincts, I should say. A couple other points about the DS200 tabulators is never connected to the internet. Um, it is all coded uh, locally, and then, like I said, it is tested. A fun fact for you uh, with our testing and how rigorous it is, uh, for the special election we just had in May, we tested over 13,000 ballots on our machines, which is almost double what we had actually vote in the election. So <laughs> our testing is quite rigorous in Blue Earth County as it is across the rest of the state of Minnesota. Uh, the Omni ballot is another piece of equipment deployed to all of our polling places. This is the device that allows a voter to vote independently if they choose to do so. It uh, reads the ballot to voters. It enlarges the font. It is a very fancy printer. It's a very fancy pen to fill in the ovals on the on the official ballot. Uh, the Omni ballot uh, is also locally controlled. It's not connected to the internet and it is tested uh, quite rigorously before the election. Uh, both of those pieces of equipment are part of our public accuracy test, which occurs about a week before the election. Anyone and everyone is welcome to come watch us do our final testing and certification of the equipment. Uh, no one ever takes us up on that invitation, but it is available if folks want to see how that works prior to the election day. Like I said, you'll be able to experience those in the workshop if you attend that. The pull pad we've talked about a fair amount already. The pull pad is the replacement for our paper rosters. Uh, it is a good way for us to register voters and verify voters. It also really helps us manage the absentee voting process to make sure that somebody doesn't mail in a ballot and then try to sneak into the polls and vote as well as, the, as those devices are updated uh, multiple, multiple times on election day. The last piece of equipment you haven't seen before if you're a returning judge, because that is our central counter. Uh, that is a uh, DS450. That is a very fancy tabulator. It processes ballots in uh, a, a larger quantity at a faster rate. And so that's what we use for all the ballots that are returned to our office via the mail process or absentee voting process. So just wanted to introduce you to that. Uh, the next several slides are actually going to talk about setting up and tearing down those equipment pieces. Uh, and we will go into all of that when we do the other class. Again, they're provided here just so that you can use those slides in one spot if you would need a resource, but they're also made available on election day for everyone. So with that, I'm going to take the last couple of minutes and open the floor to any questions that you might have before we close up the session. We've had some really good questions so far, but if we've got anything else, yes, sir. Uh, two questions for me, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the 8 p.m. crowd, they showed up five minutes before 8, and then you got to repeat and come back. Can they come back to the line or not? Yeah, I they would. In line? I, I, in that instance, we want to make sure they're in line at 8 p.m. So I would either have them rush so they're back before 8 or try to have them work through the voting process before leaving the rest. Okay, but I mean, okay, so it's 8.30 because they said to be line. Yeah. Can they leave and come back? So what will happen in that instance is um, you will have your greeter judge be the end of the line. So that's going to tell you who is eligible to vote and not eligible to vote. If you would find yourself in a circumstance where you know that is going to be a 30 minute wait and somebody needs to use the restroom, your greeter judge can help that process out by escorting them. But we need to make sure that we're not allowing other people to join that line. Thanks. Yeah. And then uh, pictures. Yes. Can a family take a picture of their son voting? 
That is a question we get all the time, right? So the law tells us that you can't record the voting process and that goes for the media, it goes for challengers, it goes for anybody. So the answer to that question technically is no, right? But we also know that technology and society has changed where people want to capture those images and whatnot. So you're gonna use your discretion in that regard and always, always encourage people to do that photo outside of the polling place with their eye loaded sticker. That should be just as good for them. And, and you're gonna to try to say, hey, let's give you a sticker and you can take your picture in the parking lot or outside the door. That's what we had to do. I just wanna make sure that we're gonna be able to in. No, no, that would be the right way to handle that. So I do have a question that follows up with that. Then, so the media, um, there are not supposed to be media photos taken? Uh, so the, the media is allowed in the polling place, but they are not allowed to document voters. So what will usually happen in that instance is they'll actually be taking footage of feet. They'll be taking pictures of election judges if you allow them to do that. Uh, our, the, our local media is really good. They understand those laws. And so while they're there, they know to not record somebody's face. They do that all in the parking lot. Don't get me wrong. Right. They'll find that voter, but then it's up to that voter afterwards. So they kind of know how to handle themselves in that regard. Very good. Any other questions? Oh. Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Go ahead. Holsters may uh, talk to people outside. Help right outside the door, 100 feet away, you know? Uh, so exit holsters are allowed within your, I'll call it your 100 foot bubble. Um, they shouldn't be in the polling place. Uh, we have judges who are Minnesota nice, and, and I fully respect that if it's a cold winter day in November, being in your vestibule or whatnot is not inappropriate in my opinion, as long as the exit holder is respecting that privilege that's been provided to them, but really they should be outside of the polling. Um, this doesn't happen a lot, but once in a while, somebody from an area township will come to Mapleton and will say, so sorry, um, since you don't live in Mapleton, but you still have time to go down to the, the courthouse. Is that the option or is there other yeah. options? Uh, voters always have to vote in the precinct in which they reside. So in the instance you described there, if they don't live in the city of Mapleton proper, then they live in one of the townships and they need to either vote in that township or surrounding Mapleton are pretty exclusive in mail ballot precincts. So their option would be come to the courthouse. We're open until 8 p.m. Their other option would be to vote the ballot that they received 46 days ago. Uh, they would have had that opportunity sure. and then they could deliver that ballot to our office as well. So they have a couple of choices available to them. Yep. Other questions? All right, so the last slides, again, are resource slides for you. So we want to make sure that you know all the tools that you have available. Uh, and then we also want to just kind of leave with some contact information for folks that uh, you might want to reach out to. Uh, we do communicate pretty exclusively through email. So pay attention to that, um, especially as you get a couple weeks before the election, because that's when you will get your assignment if you're working in Mankato. We email out those assignments. Um, we will also do some text messaging if you've allowed us to do that. Um, and we also, in some instances, make phone calls if we have concerns. Uh, but otherwise, you'll get your assignment a couple weeks before the election. You'll also hear from your head judge via email or by phone uh, to talk about what the election day might look like as well. So with that, I'm going to leave you unless we do have any other questions.